Hello everybody, this is Eric Chaconis for the E1 ACL Injury Rehab Lecture. This is all created originally by Dr. Bergman as part of her fellowship training. She uh, created this content based upon a patient that she and I saw, a post-operative ACL patient, and as well as the Kevin Wilk March 2012 paper in JOSPT. You're encouraged to read that. That is the required reading that goes along with this lecture, so please Check that out, and we'll, we'll get going here. So most of your ACL injuries you're going to see are going to be non-contact injuries. It's, it's just somebody's running, cutting, pivoting, landing in an awkward position, and that'll tear the ACL. So usually it's a valgus position of the knee where the, knee, the femur is adducted and internally rotated, and that'll put too much stress on the ACL tissue. You'll see excessive anterior translation of the tibia on the femur. And then the other thing that can do it is more of a knee extension landing. So if they land with a straight knee, then that's going to put too much uh, pressure, too much stress on the ligament tissue, not enough on the muscle tissue, and that'll cause the tearing, oftentimes a hyperextension uh, type of a tear. I'll give you some examples here. You can see the soccer players goes to kick the ball, lands, his foot is so far outside of his center of gravity, and because of that, his knee's kind of caught inside, it's kind of caught in a valgus position, and with that excessive valgus and internal rotation, it's going to put too much stress on the ligament tissue. So you watch it in real time. Another example, somebody just running, cutting, Jamal Anderson from the Falcons, running, cutting, can't really tell if he hits somebody, it doesn't look like he hits anybody in that, in that picture, he's just kind of making a sharp, a sharp sideways move and that causes excessive internal rotation which tears the ACL. And then they're just showing you the bone tendon bone, so the patella tendon uh, graft that's going to go into the femoral tunnel, tibial tunnel, suture it into place. So the most common demographic that you really primarily concerned about is the young adolescent female. Young adolescent females are much more likely to tear their ACL and oftentimes what we see is this dynamic valgus position where the femur is adducted, internally rotated, the rear foot's in excessive pronation, and that knee is really towards midline. That's putting the knee in a really dangerous position to tear a ligament. So it really depends on the sport and it depends on the age, but significantly higher likelihood for females to tear their ACL compared to males, although it does happen to males and you do see it, like I said before, in contact situations as well sometimes. But these are all things that you worry about. If they land with not enough knee flexion, then they're at risk. If they don't have good gluteus medius strength or motor control, then they're at risk. If they land with a lot of knee valgus, then they're potentially at risk. So. You want to address all those things and hopefully prevent uh, injury. That would be the ultimate goal. Also, the, the old kind of thinking, classical thinking of quad to hamstrings ratio, which, is, which still holds up in a lot of the research where we have a quad dominant individual, not enough hamstring uh, activation or hamstring strength compared to quad strength, and that predisposes them to injury as well. Excessive anterior translation of tibia on femur. All those issues of the glute max, the glute med, are all really neuromuscular issues. So if we don't have proper hip control, if we don't have proper core control, then the trunk sits outside of that, can land outside of the base of support, the knee can land in a valgus position, and that will potentially cause injury. The other thing to think about is fatigue, right? So a lot of times these injuries happen at the end of practice or at the end of a game when the person's very fatigued. And so building fatigue-resistant motor control is, is crucial when you're talking about preventing these injuries or returning these 
uh, injured individuals back to their sport. If you don't have good timing, then there's potentially going to be abnormal valgus position. So that's an important concept is if all you do is work on strength of the glutes, you know, glute med, glute max, and you get them strong, they're still predisposed to tearing because they don't have proper motor control. They're not uh, timing the muscular activation appropriately. So when they land, they don't know how to land. There's very much a cognitive component to this. And what a lot of the research has shown is you have to uh, give the person feedback, visual feedback. They need to see themselves land over and over again to be able to restore that movement. So you'll see we use a lot of uh, mirrors and videos to have our, our patients train the landing movement or the step down movement to prevent that knee valgus. Trunk position is huge. We touched on that earlier, but if you don't have good core motor control, good core strength, then you're definitely at risk for injury because the knee position relative to the center of gravity is potentially going to be uh, off. And then the knee flexion, hip extension paradox, you really need to get that co-knee flexion, hip flexion. You need to get normal orthokinematics of the knee joint so they have plenty of flexion when they land. They have a nice soft landing motor control. It's good. They don't put as much stress on the ligament tissue. There are some other factors you got to think about. So ext extrinsic factors like the weather and the surface that they're on. Obviously, if you're on a field that is not of good quality, then there's a higher risk of injury. And some of the things that you can do are prophylactic bracing. You'll see that in college football where they have the linemen wear braces to prevent knee injuries because they know that they're going to get somebody rolled over over their knee. Um, and then weather is, is certainly always an issue when you have a wet field and there's potent, more potential for uh, you to fall. Intrinsic factors you can't really do a whole lot about, um, but hormone, there's thought to be a hormonal component to it. Maybe that's why females tear their um, ACLs more often. There's definitely thought to be a structural component to it. So whether it's the slope of the tibia or the depth of the tibia, the proximal tibia, maybe leading them to more instabilities potentially, or, or the size of the notch. And the, the thing about the notch size is it may correlate to size of the ACL ligament, and that may potentially put people at risk for injury as well if they have a smaller notch. If the patient tears their ACL and comes into your clinic preoperatively, the things that you're going to see are, are definitely a positive Lachman. So on the bottom there, the Lachman's test, uh, is the better of the two. Lachman's is better than anterior drawer because it's done in more of a loose pack position. The patient's usually not able to guard as well. So you just pull that tibia in an anterior direction and if you feel laxity or you feel excessive mobility, then that's potentially indicative of an ACL tear. The anterior drawer test, their knees flex to 90. So they're in a much more optimal position to guard with the hamstrings. They can contract their hamstrings and protect the excessive anterior translation. The other thing you worry about sometimes is if they have a concomitant meniscus tear, maybe there's more congruency between the joint surfaces there and you'll get a block to movement. Or if they have excessive effusion in the knee joint, a lot of times these people have effusion post-injury and so if the knee's flexed, it's a little harder to move it. Um, but an anterior drawer still should be performed. It's just if you get a negative anterior drawer, you want to make sure you do the Lachman's. You want to make sure that you um, don't get a false negative anterior drawer. So the Lachman's is definitely your go-to test. The brush test or the swipe test to pick up fluid in the knee. A lot of times these knees have fluid in them post-injury and we want to identify that. Just because you tear your ACL does not necessarily mean you're going to have problems. It does not necessarily mean you need surgery. So if somebody has an ACL rupture, but they don't have any instability, no episodes of functional instability, they're, when they walk, when they step, when they run, they do just fine, um, then they might not be a candidate for surgery. And the other important thing to think about is if you receive uh, ACL reconstruction, it's not necessarily going to get you back to your full activity level. So you know, we have some fairly good data in the NFL that shows that that's a little bit of a high level, you know, high level sports is a little bit challenging to extrapolate that to the rest of the population. But those those individuals oftentimes don't return to their pre-injury level. But some do. I mean, take uh, Adrian Peterson in the 2012 
NFL season, for example, he came back and was had a very successful season, um, probably better than a probably above average season for, compared to the rest of his career. So um, it's, it's, it's variable. It depends on the individual. You just have to look at that person and, and really determine uh, one of these three, three things. Are they a coper? Are they an adapter? Or are they non-coper? So a coper is somebody that can get by with no ACL perfectly fine. They don't have any episodes of functional instability. They're getting around just fine. They're not, um, they're not having any problems. An adapter is somebody that can get around just fine, but they have to adapt their level of activity. So a good example of an adapter would be a soccer player who tears their ACL. They can't go back to playing soccer because there's too much cutting and pivoting but they are able to do everything else. And maybe they switch sports. Maybe they start running uh, long distance track and field sports. And they can be quite successful with that sagittal plane movement. They don't have any instability, don't have any problems, but they had to adapt their functional level. That's a good example of an adapter. A non-coper is somebody that, even with their you know, more benign, more low level activities, they have functional instability. So a non-coper really can't function in a normal daily basis without an ACL. They just have too much giving way, too many knee problems. You can use the Delaware criteria to determine if your patient is a coper or not. So they must, to be a coper, they must do a single leg hop test over six meters and they time it. And what we do is we look at the uninvolved knee and if the involved knee, they are at least 80% as quick as they are with the um, uninvolved knee, then they're determined they meet that criteria. So you got to be almost 80% 80 80 or better compared to the uninvolved knee with the single limb hop test for time, six meter hop test for time. The outcome survey, 80% or better, that's just a uh, patient self-report functional scale a global rating of knee function of 60 or greater and they cannot have more than one episode of giving way since the initial injury so if you get one you get one chance to have a functional instability episode and if you ever have any more than that then you're not a coper we cannot define you as a coper so if you meet all four you're a coper and you may not require surgical repair it, just, it still depends though it's not not definitive and that's a conversation uh, that needs to be had with the patient the family and the entire healthcare team. If they do choose to have surgery, you have a couple options, and a lot of time it's based on surgeon preference. Sometimes it's based on patient preference, uh, but some surgeons are certainly better at performing certain techniques than others. An allograft would be usually a cadaver graft, so a cadaver um, tissue is harvested, and then that's used as your new ACL. It could be a patella tendon, anterior tib, or Achilles tendon. An autograph comes from your own body. So I think autobiography, somebody writes about themselves. Autograft is a graft tissue that comes from your own body. So BPTB is bone, patella tendon bone. Uh, it's a ligament created from the middle third of your patella tendon. And then a hamstring tendon graft, which is a uh, central part of the semitendinosus and or gracilis, and they'll make a new ACL out of that. There's a lot of debate as to which is better, and you know, I, I just there's so many variables that go into it. The concern about the cadaver graft is maybe there's a risk of infection or a risk of um, the graft being rejected by the body. That is not common. That is very very rare, um, and I. I um, the way that they're able to sanitize the tissue nowadays, it's really not a concern in most instances, but it's a conversation you'd want to have with the surgeon. The issue with the autographs are good. They're usually pretty strong, especially bone, bone tendon, bone. Uh, you get a really nice, strong fixation and usually a good long-term outcome. The problem is you're harvesting healthy tissue from the individual, and so that really slows down the rehab and slows down the outcome. A lot of your problems post-operatively are because of harvesting the graft. So a lot of your pain and swelling and stuff like that. A double bundle procedure is where they try to mimic the normal anatomy of the ACL. So they try to create 
two bundles, an anterior medial bundle and a posterior lateral bundle, and that's thought to more mimic the normal biomechanics of the ACL. Um, it's usually a more surgically complex procedure, more technically difficult, but you're seeing it done with more and more frequency uh, nowadays. So if you can see the patient pre-op, that's ideal. And the reason is if you want them to go into surgery with full range, no swelling, good quad strength, you really want to just get everything back to normal as best you can. And then if you're able to do that, your long-term outcome or your post-operative outcome is, is usually better. Here's an example of just some functional testing. Yep. We'll do a single... Let's single leg um, step down test where the patient is stepping forward off of a step and we're looking at that knee valgus position. And so we do that just to identify motor control impairments at the hip or at the foot ankle. We'll test Good. a little further with more detail. See right leg. You can see this patient is really positive bilateral. There's a Barrett movement, there's a valgus movement there. Keep your hands on your iliac well crest for us actually, that's kind of helpful. So our, our case had a concomitant meniscus tear as well as ACL tear, and our patient had an ACL repair several years prior, was doing well, um, had a successful outcome for that, and then recently before seeing us was doing a stepping exercise, doing like a high stepping exercise, and leaned forward to, to grab an object and kind of had the, her center of gravity outside of her base of support, that caused a, an aberrant movement of the knee joint, and she felt a, a kind of a click and a pop. And her knee started to lock a little bit after that. So they thought that there'd be a meniscus tear, and when they go in arthroscopically, there is a meniscus tear. Here's the femoral condyle. Here's the tibial plateau. Here's the torn meniscus. You can see a video here of the surgeon um, debriding and removing the meniscus. So he's kind of searching the joint. He'll move the knee a little bit and then probe the meniscus. And you can see there it's, it's mobile. There's a flap. There's a torn end to that meniscus. So he cleans that up and uh, debrides it. So cutting off the loose end of the meniscus, and then he'll smooth that out. Here's a lot of scar tissue that was in the anterior aspect of the joint. They had to clean all that scar tissue out. Here's the torn ACL, so the, the old graft was, had been torn. And you can see it there. It's very lax. It's very mobile. Um, they had to remove that graft and put in a new graft. And they used a hamstring uh, graft. They used a semitendinosus autograft for, for the repair. Post-surgical, we see, and we commonly see this, lots and lots of effusion and edema and ecchymosis just due to the trauma of the procedure that is uh, pretty normal. Your whole entire goal the first few days, uh, first few weeks, is to really reduce that effusion and edema as, as much as possible. Actively, there's limitation, as there usually is, of extension and flexion, and Oftentimes that's just due to the amount of effusion that's in the joint. So they're limited so much because of the effusion and the pain and the muscle guarding. And if you can reduce all of that, you can get better range of motion. So we're not doing a ton of um, heavy stretching. We're really just trying to reduce the amount of inflammation and effusion in the joint. We will perform patellar mobs in all directions, and that's one of those pieces of information from the Wilk paper where it really advocates doing patellar mobs in all directions to prevent uh, scar tissues, prevent adhesions from forming in the peripatellar area. Our patient had tenderness in the graft site and significantly impaired gait, obviously walking around with crutches uh, and a brace for safety, just because we're worried about the patient falling uh, due to poor motor control of the leg post-op. 
All right, so the principles, what we need to achieve. We must achieve full passive extension. This is so important. We cannot allow arthrofibrosis or excessive scar tissue to form in this patient's joint. That is one of the critical components to this rehab. Um, so from day one, you are working the patient to get into knee hyperextension. And oftentimes you're doing it with just a low load, long duration stretch. So we're propping the heel up on an object, allowing that knee to fall into extension. We are not really forcing it at this point. We want the patient's normal body weight and gravity just to force that low load, long duration stretch. Now, this is a critical component, a uh, critical concept here. If the opposite knee normally is hyperextended, so let's say somebody has normally five degrees of hyperextension, you're trying to match that in the operative knee. And the reason is that's their normal extension. If you get them back to zero, not as opposed to five degrees of hyperextension, you're not restoring their normal biomechanics, and that's an issue. So we want to get them into some level of hyperextension if that's what they have. So first two weeks are the key time period that you're going to try to achieve that, uh, that full extension. Here's just a picture of arthrofibrosis on an MRI, and it's a large piece of scar tissue in the front of the joint. It will significantly limit, limit knee extension. That is a big thing. If somebody does not have full knee extension, you're worried that one of the causes is arthrofibrosis. It's not as common nowadays. So surg surgical techniques are getting better and better, and so we're not seeing it uh, as often, but you really want to make sure you get on top of that knee extension to, so that it doesn't form. You're not as worried about flexion. So you're going to progress flexion as tolerated. You're not going to push it, though. <clears throat> In my experience, the more you push flexion, the more you flare them up and the slower the rehab is. So early on, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about flexion. I'll have them do heel slides and movements to work flexion, but I don't passively stretch it um, with, a very, uh, with any amount of, of force or anything like that. Uh, I let them get it kind of on their own. It'll come back pretty easy usually. We talked about patellar mobility, and then quadriceps activation is so, is so important. So we're going to start getting on top of the quads here. We'll talk about that in a second. Pain and inflammation, we know the more inflammation is in the joint, the more pain is in the joint, the more we're unable to move the joint, the more the quadriceps will get weak. So you have to address pain and inflammation with modalities, as well as a multidisciplinary approach with the healthcare team. Any pain medication that has been prescribed um, should be utilized if needed so that the patient doesn't have as much pain and they're able to recover quicker. You can see here just the persistent inflammation um, even later on in later stages, this is eight weeks post reconstruction, there's still significant inflammation here. Um, and then even nine months out. And a lot of times with our rehab, we will flare them up a little bit. So it's so important to really, really uh, encourage the patient to ice after rehab, make sure you're using modalities um, post rehab sessions. You're going to progress gait, and initially the, the brace is oftentimes locked in extension. Some surgeons will, will not necessarily want it locked in extension. Some will want it locked in extension. Your biggest reason is just you don't want them to fall down. You know, the worst situation that happens is you've got somebody with a weak quad. They fall and they fracture their patella. So you've got to prevent that. So the brace certainly uh, assists with prevention of that as well as uh, crutches. If that knee slightly flexed and use your hip muscles. We're weaning them off the crutches first, then we wean them off the brace, and then uh, usually after a couple weeks, we're going to start working on regular gates. So stepping over cones is a great way to really force that leg to weight bear and try to normalize uh, the gait. Good, slightly flexed. The gait cycle. Slightly flexed as you pull so through. We will so have the patient wear a neoprene knee sleeve. And don't just launch up on that. some Keep research. Right Wilk cites it in his paper that has been demonstrated to improve so proprioception when you have the knee sleeve on. The other thing the knee, knee, knee sleeve, sleeve does is it helps you reduce that effusion in the pelvis. joint. So we'll encourage the patient to wear a neoprene slightly sleeve for a, an extended period of time post-operative. 
got to get the quad back. It's so critical that we get quadriceps motor control back early on. So we definitely use Russian e-stim or neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation applied to the quad has been found uh, to improve long-term quadriceps strength, improve outcomes post-operative rehab. So we use it, we'll combine it with quad sets or straight leg raise or any other uh, quadricep exercise that's indicated, but we really, really want that quad to get strong. If you don't get on top of the quad early, it's, it's a challenge usually throughout the rehab to regain quadricep strength. We'll couple it with hip exercises every now and then, so you can do it with uh, sideline abduction, ensuring that the patient's form is good, they're not rolling back and compensating with their TFL or their hip flexors. But we certainly want to work that quad in all different positions and, and get it strong as quickly as possible. Neuromuscular training is, is primarily, when, when you say neuromuscular training, in this case you're talking about proprioception, you're talking about firing patterns and activation of the muscle tissue. So we really want to get co-activation of the hamstrings and quads. We want to really get that firing pattern going while they're in a weight-bearing position. And then we certainly want to work it while they're fatigued. So there's a lot of times where um, we might reverse the order of our exercises and fatigue the patient out early doing uh, the more low-level single joint exercises to the quad and then work them in a weight-bearing position to, to try to get them fatigue resistant. We do lots of squatting. We like closed chain exercises because it protects the graft a little bit more early on. You can integrate some open chain work. You just want to be careful with the end ranges of knee extension, the last um, 30, 40 degrees or so of knee extension. But squat progression for us is all about the biomechanics, making sure the hip position is appropriate, making sure the core and trunk position is good. So having the patient hold on to a bar yeah. is excellent. She can hold on to the so bar. She can really work on that. sitting back and really work on proper arthrokinematics and proper biomechanics yeah, of the lower, nice. lower limb. So we want them to get used to weight bearing, want them to get used to working quad, glutes, hamstrings in a closed chain fashion. <laughs> I wish I had like a week to work on the other stuff that I want to do. That was perfect. This is uh, later on, so we're much further out now, probably week eight, week ten, and we're working um, the squat, but we're doing it on an unstable surface, That's really, really forcing glutes and quads to, to work really hard. So when you make that surface unstable, you just get a little more co-activation, a little more co-contraction of the lower extremity musculature. <clears throat> Single leg squatting to isolate that limb, isolate that quadriceps and glute, and we're really making sure she's not dropping a hip, she's not going into a valgus position. We can progress that to an unstable surface as well. And we're just working proprioception and motor control of the entire lower extremity. It's all about the foot, ankle, knee, hip. And you can see here there's a ton of fatigue and just motor control. Um, Fasciculation as she's trying to control that leg in a weight bearing position. You see, wear the neoprene sleeve for improved proprioception. Step ups. Step ups are a great exercise for not only the quad but also the glutes, especially if we're working the side step up. We're making sure that glute meat is firing, not allowing the pelvis to drop on one side. A uh, forward step up is a great glute max exercise to work the hip, and it's also, in this case, a balance exercise because she's not holding on to anything. We'll use a mirror. We're, we want the patient to always be able to observe themselves in the mirror and be able to really recognize when they are uh, not in a good position for their lower extremity. So especially early on when we're reaching nice training and these movements, we want them to have that feedback. And you can do it on unstable surfaces as you progress. You've got to isolate glute, glute meat and really get a lot of hip pelvic control as much as we can. So cable column pulling the pelvis, in this case, to her left uh, while she's on an unstable surface to, to perturbate and really get a lot of 
co-contraction. Yeah, Stepping out, and this time we're really in the latter phases of rehab. We're much further along, closer to week 14, week 16, and we're really working that glute knee eccentrically. That's the thing. When you think about the injury and you think about the valgus force, it's an eccentric movement, and if glute meat is very, very strong eccentrically, glute, glute meat and glute max, then it's going to prevent you from falling into that position. So you've got to start training them eccentrically as well. We'll do a whole host of core exercises. This is an example of one. Um, but we really want really solid transversus abdominis, multifidus, quadratus lumborum, obliques, rectus, and so core control with uh, perturbation to the upper and lower extremities, making, and then we'll work that into a functional weight-bearing position eventually, but just making sure she's really, really solid. Side bridge for the QL and the downside glute med, great exercise for the downside glute med as you have to control your body weight there. Eventually return to sport phase where we're going to work on jumping and landing techniques and we're going to work on form, right? We would never, ever, ever send an athlete back to their sport if they're falling into this valgus position, poor motor control position. That's, that is not acceptable. They need to be perfect. They need to have perfect landing form, neutral position, good hip knee flexion so they can absorb the forces through the knee joint. Some examples of um, later return to sport. Here's Adrian Peterson in his post-operative rehab. I think this is four months before um, coming back on the field. And so he's doing a lot of drills for cutting. You see a lot of side drills, a lot of drills where he's forcing that need to take on all his body weight as he cuts and runs. Um, straight plane, sagittal plane running, side side running, cutting. You'll see him in a second here. He'll do some jumping activities, some explosive dynamic movements. And eventually they'll transition into a more strength and conditioning type of program that um, that the rest of the team is doing their, their standard strength and conditioning program modified slightly for the athlete to address any impairments uh, from the from the injury. But he's got to be he's got to be able to do all that stuff and, and more before he gets back out on the field. You certainly don't want to risk a re-injury. So a lot of things that are going to change the progression of rehab. Um, in our patient, we had a hamstring autographed and so because of that we really had a lot of trouble getting knee extension back we did that low load long duration stretch but oftentimes the patient had quite a bit of pain with it so it was a little slower than what we wanted um, getting it back and you just have to modify things for that right so we knew that the hamstring was a major issue we oftentimes would put the hip in extension and sideline and and get the knee extension stretch that way just to put the hamstring on a little bit of slack um, if you have a patella bone tendon bone then obviously a lot of your quad work early on is a little more challenging because you get that pain upon quad firing, get that pain when the, when the knee extensor mechanism is stressed. You just deal with it the best you can. You try to kind of uh, use as many modalities and palliative measures as possible to diminish the amount of inflammation and try to promote healing as quickly as you can to, to get that strength back. Most of these patients have a concomitant injury, which is so challenging. So if there's a meniscus repair, you have to take that into consideration. I've, I've read that over 90% of ACL tears have some type of bone bruise. That oftentimes results in a lot of weight-bearing pain. So if there's a bone bruise on the tibia or femoral component, you get a lot of weight-bearing pain. And then if there's any articular cartilage lesions or anything like that, that's certainly going to impact your rehab. So rehab is customized, but the principles... Uh, still stay the same. Your progression from a general standpoint is going from straight plane to multi-plane. And we always start off in straight plane and we always work the sagittal, sagittal plane first. Stable surfaces to unstable surfaces. The unstable surfaces just give you that uh, really more stimulus for the proprioception and the neuromuscular control. And you can use perturbations to kind of further stimulate that. 
<coughs> you dose them according to where they're at. So if somebody can do 12 straight leg raises in a row immediately post-op, I'm probably going to work them more or less to failure for multiple sets in a row, right? So dose them based on what their failure level is. If somebody's high level and they can do 40 straight leg raises in a row, no problem, you probably need to move on to something else. You probably need to add load or do something else to, to challenge them in order to make adaptive changes to the, to the neuromuscular system. A general kind of schema just for, for the progression, and you can, I'll leave you, you that to read. It's more spelled out with detail in the Wilk paper, and you certainly need to reference that. Some of the, the keys to success, some of the keys that we oftentimes take for granted, movement quality. If we just pass the patient off to an ancillary personnel to run through all their exercises, we're, we're not looking at quality of movement, we're definitely missing out. There were so many times where we have to correct our patient's movement, correct their knee and hip position to make sure they're doing everything perfectly. Addressing that neuromuscular control when fatigued, if all you do is do the high level stuff early on, you never really address complex movement patterns when they're tired. Um, you know, that's in the safe environment of the clinic. Imagine what you're going to put them back out there when they go to return to sport. They're certainly going to be fatigued and have to do complex movements. So you want to get them ready for that. Early on, we don't do that early on. We want to just get general strength and motor control back. But later on, we certainly want to train them uh, when they are fatigued. Got to get the extension back. Got to watch that you're not pushing them too hard. If they're flaring up a lot, you got to back off a little bit because when they're flared up, it's really hard to progress. You wanna, you're really worried about that re-injury rate. So the, be, the, the more you can prevent that two-year re-injury rate, the better we're doing, right? One-year, two-year re-injury rates. We don't want these people to get hurt again. Don't send them back out if they're not ready. I mean, that's the biggest, that's the, the bottom line. And then all the deficits that we see. So even, and this is interesting, because at six and a half months, we see still a quad strength deficit. And the thing that's tricky is your, your manual muscle testing or your standard strength testing, might, they might check out just fine. You have them do some functional testing, or if you have access to isokinetic testing, you really pick up some deficits. So you got to make sure you're doing a proper exam to detect any strength deficits that are, that are there. Here's your references, and we will discuss this topic a little more in class, so please come with questions, and we're going to do some uh, case, case exercises and work through some problems together. Thank you.